This quite amazing case starts with chocolate wrappers and cheap music records and ends up with peppercorns and one of the most famous statements of contract law. Let's dive a little deeper into Chapel and Nestle. One of the requirements for the formation of a contract is that the contract must be an exchange, not a gift. Each side gives something in order to get something. In a classic sale contract, one side gives money and the other side gives a product. The legal term for the thing given by each side is consideration. So in that sales contract, the consideration given by the buyer is money and the consideration given by the seller is the product. Once we have a rule that says each side must give consideration, the next obvious question to ask is, how much? We all have a general sense of what things are worth. Many of us know what a fair price might be for something, or we have an eye for a bargain, or we know when we're being ripped off. So if consideration is necessary to make a contract, does the consideration need to be fair? The law clearly says no on this point. If a seller wants to sell their product well below retail on a throwaway discount, well, they're entitled to do so. They can even sell at a loss. An item that one person considers really valuable might be worthless to someone else. One person's trash really is another person's treasure. So the law needs to preserve the maximum freedom for every individual to bargain as they please. But there still needs to be a minimum. There still needs to be some lower threshold beneath which we would say you haven't actually given consideration at all. Chapel and Nestle is the case that gives us the rule. The case took place in the early years of rock and roll. The first generation to call themselves teenagers were listening and dancing to Elvis Presley, Bill Haley and his Comets, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Buddy Holly. And just before the start of the 50s in 1948, the vinyl record, which is actually made out of PVC, was invented so young people could suddenly buy the music they loved in an affordable and durable form. Nestle, the chocolate company, wanted to find a way to capitalise on the craze for rock and roll. And their idea was pretty good. They lined up with a company called Hardy Records, who had developed a process where they could make cheap and nasty records on acetate film, much cheaper than vinyl records but they could only be a couple of minutes long. So Nestle's idea was to buy a whole bunch of these cheap records and to sell them to anyone who could send in three Nestle chocolate wrappers and a postal order for a shilling and sixpence. This was a good deal for the teenagers because a record in a normal record store would cost six shillings and sixpence. Nestle could therefore sell a bunch more chocolate and the teenagers would be able to buy records. Everybody wins. Everybody except the artists, that is. You see, the copyright laws at the time said that anyone could make and sell records of any song if their intention was to sell those records by retail. All the record manufacturer needed to do was pay a royalty to the artist of six and a quarter percent of the ordinary retail selling price of the record. From the artist's perspective, the Nestle promotion was a disaster. Instead of being entitled to six and a quarter percent of the full retail price of six shillings and sixpence, they would be entitled to six and a quarter percent of a much smaller price, one shilling and sixpence. And once the teenagers had the Nestle version of the record, why would they pay a bunch more money to get the vinyl version? The artists and the record producers wanted to put a stop to it. They chose, as the vehicle for their case, a song called Rockin' Shoes by a band called The King Brothers. Chapel and Co. were the copyright holders for the song, and this was one of the songs that Nestle were going to use for their promotion. Chapel and Co. therefore stood to lose a lot of money in royalties. They made a number of arguments, but in the end, the real issue came down to the nature of the chocolate wrappers. Remember, to buy a record, you had to send in three chocolate wrappers plus the money order. Here's how the argument went. The law 
only allowed people to make records of other people's music if the records were to be sold at retail. It seems to have been quite well understood that a retail sale, in this sense, meant the simple exchange of money for a product. If the sale of these records was something other than a retail sale, well then the copyright law wouldn't protect the record manufacturer and Nestle could be forced to stop selling the records. There were two completely different ways to see the chocolate wrappers. On the one hand, you could argue, and Chappell did argue, that the chocolate wrappers were part of the consideration given for the contract. The deal was, Nestle would supply one record in return for three wrappers and some money. If that was the case, if the wrappers were part of the consideration, well then the sale wasn't a retail sale anymore. It wasn't just money for a product. The alternative way to see the situation was that the wrappers were not part of the consideration. On this argument, having three chocolate wrappers was just a way to qualify to purchase the chocolates. So on this argument, Nestle were saying, we will sell these records at retail for one shilling and sixpence, but we will only sell them to people who have bought three of our chocolates and who can prove it by sending us the wrappers. But the sale itself is just money for a record, and so it's a retail sale. The whole thing then came down to the nature of the chocolate wrappers. If they were part of the consideration, then it's no longer a retail sale and chapel wins. If they were not part of the consideration, then it is a retail sale and Nestle wins. The advertisements advertising the scheme seem to be pretty clear about the wrappers being part of the exchange and not merely a qualification to participate in the contract. One of the ads cited in the judgment said, Remember, all you have to do to get each new star's record is to send three wrappers from Nestle's sixpence milk chocolate bars together with a postal order for one and six. The majority judges found that the wrappers were part of the consideration. So Nestle gave the consumer a record and the consumer gave Nestle three wrappers and a sum of money. But how do we reconcile this with the fact that the wrappers were just trash? They had no value in any practical sense. Some of the judges said that they had value because they signified that the person had spent sixpence on chocolate. But that seems a bit of an artificial argument. Lord Somerville of Harrow won the argument and wrote himself into legal history with the following observations. It is said that when received, the wrappers were of no value to Nestle's. This I would have thought irrelevant. A contracting party can stipulate for what consideration he chooses. A peppercorn does not cease to be good consideration if it's established that the promisee does not like pepper and will throw away the corn. In other words, it's not for the court to decide the value of consideration. If the consideration has any value at all, even the value of a single peppercorn, it will be value enough and the contracting parties can choose for themselves what consideration they want from the other side. As a result, the sale of the records by Nestle was not a retail sale, and so they were not protected by the copyright law. They were therefore restrained from continuing to sell the records. For our purpose as students of contract law, this case stands as authority that consideration must have some minimal level of economic value. But once it has that tiny little skerrick of value, that will be enough to meet the requirements for formation of contract. Because of this case, nowadays, when we talk about a contract where one side has only given the tiniest amount of value in consideration, we say that they have only given peppercorn consideration.